So I think to first start out, my name is Kyle Ashworth. I'm the host of the Letter Gay Stories podcast. Uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> So we just set up a big booth at Pride, and so many people didn't want to stop by because we were very Mormon. And <laughs> Don't let the, the name Latter Gay Stories fool you. Um, really, the podcast was set up as a soft landing for what I often call gaybies, little baby gay Mormons who fall out of the closet and usually only hit a hard surface. I started the podcast to try to create resources to connect people and, and give people an opportunity to fall out of those closets in a healthy, soft, and manageable way so they can stand up and run and thrive like Matt and so many others. That's what we tried to do with the Latter Gay Stories podcast. It originally was named the Gay Mormon Stories podcast, opened by the Open Stories Foundation when the church said Mormon is now taboo. Uh, I tongue-in-cheek renamed the podcast to the Latter Gay Stories podcast, and I don't know which they prefer. <laughs> But that's just a little premise behind what we do, and really we're giving an opportunity for all people in or out of Mormonism to share their stories. And I, and I think that's maybe something we're going to talk a, lot, a little bit about um, tonight. And as you watch more of the episodes of Mormon No More, you'll see that there isn't just one way to gay. There are multiple levels. <laughs> and regardless of where you are on at the, or where you're at on that journey, there is a story, there is a roadmap, there is very, in a very real way, pavement and asphalt to help you move forward. And no more or fewer boulders, few more mountains, few, fewer areas that we have to carve in order for our community to, to make a better uh, a way of, of progress. So for that, I want to thank this panel who continues to pave and make this trail a little easier for those little baby gays who are falling out of the closet tomorrow. All right, so I want you to get to know um, this panel as well before we jump into questions. So we'll start with you, Brad, and then we'll just pass the, um, we'll pass the mic along. Okay, hello. My name is Bradley Talbot. I'm the founder of Color the Campus. Hi. What, is there anything I'm specific? Episode I'm episode two, so I'm the next one. Um, and my mom is featured as well. She honestly needs the recognition. She did amazing. Yeah. Um, is there anything specific you want to know? Um, As an introduction? Basically, how, yeah. And then how did you get involved with the, the show? Um, so I think lighting the why was really what caught people's attention. <laughs> um, it changed my life. Um, and I don't know what I was thinking. I knew it was going to be a big deal, but I didn't think it was going to be that big of a deal. <laughs> um, I thought people would forget about it a week or so later, and we would be able to move on. And I ended up not being able to do any schoolwork for the next month because I was trying to recover. Um, but I think that's um, when they reached out to me. They reached out through that account, Color of the, Color of the Campus, and um, told me kind of about what was going on with this and if I wanted to be involved and I said yes, I'd love to. So Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Rin. Uh, I'm also episode two. I'm one of the anonymous BYU students they interviewed, so I will be moderating my answers as I am still at BYU and I don't want to get kicked out for this. <laughs> yeah. um, and I got involved with the, the Mormon No More, um, I was going to call it a podcast, it's not a podcast, it's a documentary, uh, through USGA, of which I'm a part, I'm on the New Student Outreach thing, and I run the Queer Mentors Program. Hi everyone, my name is Maddie Easton, I'm Jeffrey R. Holland's favorite BYU student. <laughs> yes. We love you, Jeff, we love you. Um, I got involved through the podcast, and I have to be honest, they have become, you know, my second and third mom. I'm so inspired, I even want to look like Sally. So that's why I dye my hair. Nice to meet you all. Yeah. You can usually tell the phase of gay by the color of the <laughs> hair. And so, I don't know, Nan, I saw you with some, uh, yeah, with some, blonde, hair. some blonde hair was showing up in those episodes. That's right. That's what it is doing. Uh, I'm, as I mentioned, my name is Kyle Ashworth. I'm also in season two as I worked with ABC and 
or I'm sorry, episode two, uh, in covering the color of the campus with the podcast and uh, broadcasting that live stream, which was a total success. There were thousands of people that watched the live stream of uh, the lighting of the Y in the transgender colors and then surrounding BYU's uh, potential arresting of the uh, family members and, and, and community members who were up on the hill. So that's an exciting part. This uh, episode two is... No spoilers. No spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Lena, your turn. I'm Lena Osborne, Sally's <laughs> wife. <laughs> Spoiler, we got married. <laughs> uh, we had a post go viral on Same Sex Parents Instagram, which is a really great platform for queer moms and dads and theys and thems. And for people to see, it's just normal, super normal. Families look however they look and it doesn't have to be just one specific way. And yeah, the, the producer from ABC, she's Diane Sawyer's producer. She re reached out to us, she's gay and with a woman and has a child and, and just said, I want a passion project, will you do this with me? And we were like, hell yeah, we're gonna do it. <laughs> Thank you for being here. You, you've heard enough from me today, I think. <laughs> 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 Uh, that is the only the second time I've seen it, and I was a wreck back there in the back, and so I'm, I'm recovering. I got a little pep talk from this one. Uh, so thanks for being here. It's a very tender time to relive all that. It's super hard, and also I'm so, like, overwhelmed by the love and support that we've received. It's just, like, incredible, so thank you. Yeah, first first time I've seen it other than on my couch at like one in the morning with with Lena. So I'm Nan. I'm Sally's mom. <laughs> I am proud to be here, and uh, just like Sally said in the in this episode, she said never in a million years. Could you have told me that this was going to be my life? And I feel the same way. Never did I think this is what, where I would be. But I couldn't be happier to be here. And this is where I want to be. Hi, I'm Rod. I'm Sally's dad. Uh, I just want to say... Um, you know, we're in it because they filmed us, and, and we're Sally's dad. <laughs> or, I'm Sally's dad, she's her mom. Um, the real courageous people are the Matt Eastons and the Brad Talbots and the Kyle Ashworths and the Sallys and Lenas of this world. And I am honored to be here with them. Same. <laughs> uh, my name is Sam. I'm Sally's little brother and her favorite mannequin to dress up. Uh, we, all of us look the same because Sally styles us. And uh, I dyed Nan's hair blonde. And yes, uh, that's me. I'm Sam. Hello, I'm Joe. I'm Sally's uh, youngest brother. Great to be here. I uh, don't remember my fourth birthday party. That's a, <laughs> a spoiler. That's the one line I get the whole show. So, <laughs> out of all the side characters, I am the sidest of the side characters. <laughs> Happy to be here. Sam, Sam's, uh, Sam takes the stage in the like the third episode a bunch. So. You got that to look forward to. Yeah, you blew my questions. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> I had one question. I actually, um, I appreciate the candidness, Sally, of, of your response to seeing this for the second time. I wonder, as you uh, have now watched all four episodes, been here with the, stu with the audience, and, and then be able, uh, being able to field some of the uh, audience reactions, was Mormon No More, uh, a documentary that exceeded your expectations 
what was your overall thought regarding the end product? I didn't, I, I'm like all Eckhart Tolle now, so like meaning I was trying not to have expectations. Like I did this and the whole time I was like, I'm doing this for the experience that this that, that I'm having and for the people that this is going to help. And I knew, I just let go of control. I let complete control, because the editors, they have all the say. So if I tried to like have this big expectation, that was just causing myself suffering. So I kind of like let that go from the beginning and just tried to be my highest self the whole time and, and be as real as I could without, um, you know, hurting my kids. I was thinking of my kids the whole time and just trying to be, like, trying to put forth um, something, a product that was going to help me, the me five years ago, you know? And uh, it it has blown me away. It's I thought that, that it turned out really good. There's a few um, little editing things that were kind of hard for Lena and I were, um, it's TV, right? So they, they conflated a few things and, and that's okay. I mean, that's TV and that's kind of like why you have to let go of control. Overall, the message obviously came across. We've been inundated with love and just like, this has changed my life and thank you for doing this. So um, I think the response speaks for itself. Lena, you originally talked about being stupidly in love, which I love that. I love that line. Um, and when we were in the beginning episode, Nan, you were stupidly Mormon. <laughs> and I say that with the kindest of descriptors. My question is actually, as a Mormon family, when your child comes out, this is, this is an arena we don't spend a lot of time talking about, the parent's perspective. It's, it's often really difficult for the person to come out. Uh, you have now put on display through Mormon No More your whole family's experience with Sal's coming out. Um, I'm curious what your, how your family has grown uh, and what were your thoughts originally when she came out with the lens of Mormonism, and then not giving spoilers away as we go through the, the series, um, and maybe just a brief intro as to how that has shifted or grown in, in expectation. When Sally came out, it was, first of all, a big surprise. But as you can see through all these photos and family videos, it shouldn't have been a surprise. <laughs> um, when we watch him now, we're like, how did we not see something there? But anyway, it was a big surprise. That took a little bit of time to, to adjust to. But then after that, it was all systems go. I was on board. I think all of us were on board. Joe was on his mission when Sally came out. She called him on his mission. And he just said, I'm here with you, Sally. I love you. I was really proud of our family for that. Um, as a mom, the biggest thing I had to learn was to how to show love to Sally in a way that she felt loved. Because my usual ways uh, weren't gonna work as much now. And I had to figure that out. And there were plenty of times that I didn't do that very successfully. Um, but Sally, you know, we talk about holding space for our loved ones in their new life. Sally held space for me just as much as I held for her. So when I said something that later I learned hurt her feelings, at the time she didn't say anything and she did not take offense which allowed me to not be nervous about how I spoke and what I said. So she, she helped me in, and led the way in that. Our whole family has grown in ways we didn't know we needed to grow. I didn't know I needed to grow. I was the Relief Society president. I've got it covered. <laughs> but, but this was 
I look at it now like Sally gave us the gift of the opportunity to expand ourselves and to grow. And I will be forever thankful. The episode hinted or brought into um, kind of the worldview, your podcast, um, Coming Out Coach. Peace out. Oh, sorry, peace out, peace out. Then <laughs> the Coming Out Coach. I'm wondering, is it, was it easier to come out of the closet or come out of the church? Great question for Lena first. Yes. Well, I feel like I, um, my answer is not typical because I was a convert to the church. And so I had those lovely 18 years outside of Mormonism, my formative years where I was taught to have an inner knowing and to, to trust my inner knowing and to build that confidence in myself. And so when I was baptized at BYU when I was 18 and I was a faithful member for 20 years of my life, I feel like every time I felt the spirit, it was that recognition of self and so when I left the church, I just gained that. I, I owned that again. I got ownership back of this thing that I gave away. And so it didn't feel foreign. It felt like I was coming back to myself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so I gave a talk on Easter Sunday. That was my last time ever going to church. And I... I was there. She came, to, she came to see me speak, and it was an interesting experience, actually, because, and I said to talk to you. Yes, I, yes, I remember that, and too. Like, Why is Sally going to give a spiritual attack? <laughs> <laughs> she, it was probably the only dress left in her closet. I was already out of the church for, like, a year and a half at that point. Yeah. So. And I, you know, I saw the audience, and I just remember everyone in the pews kind of, feeling like there was this distance between us that kept getting bigger and bigger as I got through my talk and it felt like these cinder block walls were being built and I just I felt this growth and this evolution happening while I was speaking the words and it was an, a different kind of talk than the average talk you would hear in church it was we don't need to judge people we should we shouldn't ever say what is the thing hate this yeah love the Love the sin, hate the sin, whatever. You know what I'm saying. Love, hate the sin, love the sinner. Yeah. <laughs> love the sinner. Yes, I wanted to just do away with all that shit. And I was very um, open about how I felt because my sweet son was sitting in the pew and he's, you know, talking about his sexuality from two years old. And so in my mind, I'm like, this is not a safe place for him. And so by the time I finished that talk, it's like I came to terms with myself that this was going to be my last Sunday in church. And it was. That Friday, I came out. So I never went back. So I, I would say it happened at the same time for me. Yeah. You're privileged. To have that. Uh, yeah. Um, I would say leaving the church was harder, uh, for sure, because it's like everything I knew was an existential crisis. Like, I was a wreck. I did not, I was super, super, super traumatized. Uh, coming out wasn't that hard compared to like getting divorced. So it was like breaking up the family and telling my husband and going through that was very difficult. Coming out at that point, um, I was uh, like, I heard somebody say the other day, it's, it's 2022, if you're not gay, grow up. <laughs> it's good, right? <laughs> So I wasn't Mormon anymore, and I was, like, not, you know, like, scared to be gay, but I, I was married and all that, so, yeah. We have a lot of mixed orientation marriage stories we can share. Yeah. And I think one important part, I, I, you kind of hinted to it, is that I didn't choose to be gay, but I did choose to be Mormon. And one of those is intrinsic, and the other one I had a control over. And so that's an easier or maybe a better way of navigating that world. Thank you for bringing up BYU, because then I look, I'm like, really, this is like the BYU? We have the Osbournes and then the BYU section. <laughs> it's like President Hinckley's old quote, you're not much to look at, but you're all the Lord has. <laughs> this is what we get from BYU. Maybe Elder Holland was right. 
I'm just kidding. That's true. Uh, I want to start with you, Brad. Um, so you've now graduated from BYU. Uh, you colored the campus literally in rainbow colors. Um, what have you seen change at, um, at BYU through the course of your advocacy, but also just public advocacy and shining a light on BYU's uh, terrible or uh, complicated history with LGBTQ students and the community? So I started at BYU in 2017, and um, I've shared this a few times, but uh, during my freshman year, I took the infamous Eternal Families class, um, and I actually took it with my then kind of girlfriend, which was interesting. Um, it didn't work out. And um, there was a time where the professor was talking about LGBTQ experiences and things like that. And there was a kid who was like a couple rows away from me and he raised his hand and he said, you know, I don't care if you want to be gay. I don't care if you want to be trans. I don't just, why do I have to be their friend? Why do I have to go out of my way and reach out to somebody? We're not going to get along. And I wasn't out at that point. And I remember thinking like, you don't even know me and you already don't want to be my friend. You don't care. Um, had some other experiences with other classmates, roommates, family members, um, and eventually just found myself just totally alone. And I thought, there is like no one who cares <laughs> about me. Um, and so I was inspired to um, start Color the Campus. I actually had a dream. Um, funny how that happens. Um, I had a dream that I painted campus in rainbow colors, um, and it happened a few times. It was recurring, and I was like, what is that? <laughs> That's weird. Um, but one thing led to another. I started an account. I was still, like, pretty closeted. Um, I started an account. I was like, I'll just be anonymous and just start, like, sharing things, and what if we all just, like, wore rainbow? Like, it doesn't mean anything. Just, like, wear rainbow. Um, just to show, like, I don't need to know you, but I will be your friend. Because I felt like... <laughs> because I felt like so many people didn't know me and didn't want to be my friend. Um, and it grew. It started with just, like, my family, and then it grew to bigger, and then it got huge. Um, so the the change has been really overwhelming and inspiring to see. By the time I graduated, I was like, there are people <laughs> who love me and care about me and want to be my friend. Um, there's so many other groups on campus that have started um, that have told me that I inspired them to start um, their organizations and more people are talking about it, which really that was the biggest thing that I felt was hard was no one wanted to talk about it and so we couldn't get anywhere. Now everyone's talking about it. Sometimes we talk about it too much. Um, so it's, it's really great to see and it's a totally different and I uh, can only imagine if I had seen that when I had first started BYU, I would have had a very different experience and it would have meant the world to me. So. I do have a question specifically for you, Rin, as well, being a student at BYU. Um, BYU has done a number of things, for better or for worse, to try to uh, navigate the, its LGBTQ relationship. Um, given what Brad just talked about, and you still being a current student at BYU, and BYU's uh, inclusion of the BYU Office of Belonging, uh, an organization trying to bridge these gaps between uh, sexuality and their reality, um, was Brad effective? Is the BYU Office of Belonging effective? And what can BYU do at this point to help students like you feel seen, noticed, and wanted at a church education system school? All right. That's a big question. <laughs> okay. So I think Brad is super effective. I remember Rainbow Days were one of my first, like, interactions with other queer members on campus, and it was, like, so amazing for me to find out I wasn't alone. I started at BYU in 2018, so only a year after Brad. I've got a year to go. I switched my major too many times. <laughs> um, 
as, and I just wrote a paper on this and I just published it, so I feel like I should be like really prepared for this. Yeah. Um, so regarding Rainbow Days, I think they're super great, they're super effective, they are one of the most vocal shows of support on campus for BYU queer students. Uh, so thank you, Brad. Um, then the Office of Belonging, they're still getting it up and running. What they have right now is the Office of Student Success and Inclusion, which they do like confidential events, but they don't get great turnout as far as I've seen. I feel like the organizations that are making the most change are BYU students. I think things like USGA, which meets weekly during the school year and, probably, and Rainbow Days. Um, what was the next part of the question? What can BYU do to best support queer students? Um, well, this might be a little radical to say. They could give us rights. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> like, first of all, I want to be able to date without like being scared I'm going to get kicked out. Yeah. Um, I want to be able to wear my little crop tops and not get told by my like TA, who's an elderly lady, that that's not honor code appropriate. <laughs> yeah. um, that happened to me on last Wednesday. Like the lady was like, "You need to pull your shirt down. That's not honor code appropriate." And I was like, "I'm sorry. I was showing less than an inch of skin. I didn't realize it would be an issue." <laughs> um, I think, in more solid terms, we could. How do I phrase this? I think what BYU needs to do is to show more vocal support for students and actually like stop persecuting queer students. I have a friend who's actually also in the documentary um, as one of the other anonymous BYU students and they are currently uh, under investigation from the honor code office. So I think we need to stop investigating queer students for things that straight students want to get investigated for. And I think that we just need to be more Christ-like and show love to our fellow man because Christ never said anything about being gay. Thank you, thank you. I want to talk about one of the leading causes of death in Utah, and especially among this uh, population, uh, suicide, and the white stole. I've interviewed you. Um, I didn't know, I had no idea of the white stole story. Um, why, I mean, I know Harry, I know how important uh, the Harry Fisher story is to you, Matt. Um, why in, in that opportunity where you took that white stole in your hands, what was it about him, of all people, that caused you to do what you did? And then maybe uh, by doing what you did, I, I mean writing uh, a little tribute to him. And then maybe give the audience a little bit of a better understanding as to your relationship with Paul, uh, Harry's dad. Absolutely. Um, I think the documentary probably said it best, so I'll try to keep it short. But yeah, I remember being a freshman and, and the first gay person I ever personally knew um, died by suicide within three months of me meeting him. And, um, and I thought I was going to end up the same way. You know, I mean, Sally, you mentioned the same thing. I think that, unfortunately, the reality is is that probably every queer person you talk to has thought about taking their own life. Um, if not, they're one of the very lucky few. Um, and so when I decided to put Harry's name on my stole, I, I wanted to honor him. Like I said, I wanted to carry him across that stage. And I wanted to say for every future Harry Fisher out there in the crowd, um, I'm, we've got your back. You can do this. You're going to pull through. And, um, and we can have a fucking amazing time. We, you know, we can, yes. I, uh, it is, like Kyle said, it's uh, one of the leading causes of death among our population, especially here in Utah. And um, we will never stop talking about it until it stops happening. And unfortunately, the reality is, is that every general conference, when it comes around, the Trevor Project lines are full of, of people who are uh, idealizing suicide. Um, I've called that same line um, before. And um, yeah, something's got to change. And it starts with us here in this theater, but it cannot end here. And um, that's one thing that I'm, I know for sure. Oh, yes, yes. Um, so as you see in the documentary, uh, that actually was the very first time that I ever met Paul Fisher. Um, I, 
I knew <laughs> Harry's story obviously impacted me, but I didn't know his family at all. After I graduated, things got crazy. I moved out of state, and then the pandemic hit. And so I actually never had a chance to meet this family. Um, and so when Sally and Lena reached out and said, hey, we're doing this documentary, I get interviewed, I tell them my inspiration, and they said, Matt, you got to give that stole to Harry's family. And I thought, yes, I've been waiting three years to do this. Um, Harry's, uh, Harry's dad is actually not a member of the church. Um, his mother is, so there is some conflict I know in their family with um, their their own religious identity. Uh, but meeting Paul was just so special. I mean, it, it was this person that I finally got a chance to to tell Harry's family um, that he really did save my life, and and uh, I hope I can do the same. I, I know that Sally and Lena, Rin and and um, Bradley, we're, that's what we're here to do is to save these lives. Thank you. Sally, you brought up that same uh, sentiment, uh, suicidal ideation and, and the risk of suicide at LGBTQ uh, Mormons in particular experience um, navigating this journey. I wonder what your thoughts are about uh, young Sally, who's questioning who and what she is. Would a documentary like Mormon No More, would it have made a difference in your journey? And the same question to you, Lena, after. Wow, I, I didn't even know any, I didn't even know of any out gay people, like other than what, Ellen when she came out. And, and I'm serious, like, I lived in North Idaho, in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and yeah, and um, very Mormon, and um, I, you guys, you know, like, they protected me from Anything that was, like, queer curious, they're like, no, 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 they're not, what do you, no. And they just like, nope. And in fact, like, you had a friend that was gay when we went, lived in Houston, and I knew it, but you guys wouldn't talk about it, you know? So it was not only taboo, but, like, very unknown. And this would have completely, I would have been just, like, mind blown if this would have come out when I was a kid and would have definitely, you know, made me have more courage, you know? Like, not only, not only would it have helped me to feel better about myself, but would have changed the trajectory of my life, for sure. Love you. Okay, so unfortunately, uh, members of the church, including myself, we don't consider leaving the church until something like this happens within the four walls of our own home. It's like when it affects you personally, all of a sudden you have to really think about, is this a safe environment for my family member and, and so on and so forth. But what I'm hoping that this documentary will do is eliminate that step so that people can see the humanity in all of our stories and how they kind of, summed it up at the end of the docu-series with Sal and I, and we're all so different, but we're literally all the same. Mm -hmm. You know, we struggle with the same things. We have suicidal ideation across the LGBTQ community and so on and so forth. And I think there is something really beautiful about the message of the documentary for those who are still currently going to church and believe in the church. And that is that if you can just see the similarities between yourself and the people on the screen, it will feel personal. It doesn't have to happen in your own home. Does that make sense? Yes, love it. The Osbournes, you're not off the hook. You're in a situation I often call forced free agency. You had no choice in accepting and understanding this whole world. As, as Lena and Sal have talked about, it is, um, when we sit around a kitchen table, we realize that the people that we're talking about are no longer the things we've heard about over the pulpit. They're no longer the uh, promises and awful things that prophets and preachers and pastors and parents have often said about the LGBTQ community. So uh, what things have you learned as parents navigating this world, and I, especially to your brothers, Sally, um, how can the LGBT, how can the LDS community be a better ally, but even more broadly, as parents, as family members, and then as community members, building on what Lena's talked about, how can we do better in this space to support 
both sides of this aisle. Me. <laughs> I still go to church. <clears throat> I go to church on Sundays. Uh, and I'm in a transitionary period where I'm going to church, uh, but I'm not really believing much of it. And it's a, it's a weird space to be in. And um, it's, <clears throat> it's hard because I, I hear a lot of, of people talk about how do we, how do we help, to help the Mormon community be more accepting of uh, LGBT people? And a me right now, I'm trying to do that. Like as I go to church and I have uh, my gay sister and she's super cool and awesome and I love her and I look up to her and I try to advocate, you know, I try to tell everybody about her and I try to do all I can. But my situation at church, me going every week is unsustainable. Um, and every week I, it's harder to go. And every week uh, I feel more angry. Um, and it's it's more and more difficult to be there, um, as I see as I see uh, youth in my ward who are gay, and and struggle, and I hear things um, that their parents are saying to them, or I hear things over the pulpit. Um, so it's a it's a difficult question, and and I don't know if I have an answer, but um, I think. Visibility is key, and uh, to to try to promote. I, I wear my pride pin every week to church. Um, I try to I try to help out. You know, thanks. <clears throat> uh, the other day, I I took a I took a handful of pins to church and, and gave them out to all the youth and uh, <laughs> and um, I I paint my nails a lot, and so we had a. My deacon squirm, we painted our nails and then passed the sacrament the next day. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> um, just trying to be, you know, like uh, get people out of, out of their comfort zone a little bit and uh, let them know that it's okay to be different and it's okay to be, uh, you know, gay people aren't scary. It's not, it's not, it's not bad. You know, my sister is not bad and, and, um, yeah, it's hard, man. It's hard, but I think this this show is huge, and I hope I hope people watch it. I hope I hope people in my ward watch it. I hope those those parents of those gay kids watch it. So bad. <laughs> yeah. Sam is fucking awesome. The week before the last general conference when Elder Renlund gave a talk about Heavenly Mother, he, in, in sacrament meeting, he prayed to Heavenly Mother at the pulpit. It was, it was, he told me that story. Um, <clears throat> I was on my mission in Australia when, when Sally came out to me. I had about two months left, and she's like, my mom messaged me, and she's like, hey, Sally wants to talk to you. I was like, oh, that's not good. Like, I, like, <laughs> My mom tells me my sister wants to call me for something. I knew something was up. She's like, hey, I'm gay. I'm like, oh, shit. Like, you know, I got to, excuse my French. Um, <laughs> got to deal with it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, so it was about six months after coming home, I, I fully cut ties with the church, um, you know, due to, uh, uh, you know, I just couldn't be comfortable um, in, in, you know, being involved with Sally and Lena and, and seeing their life and, and um, experiencing the, the, the authentic love that they had that I, you know, I didn't, uh, like a lot of people, didn't have a lot of experience with, with the LGBTQ community before that. A um, couple things I'll say about, about supporting. I have a good friend uh, from, from Kansas. Uh, his name is Ted Lasso. Uh, <laughs> he's a sexy, mustachioed man. Um, uh, yeah, so he, he one, of, one of the things he said... Um, it's a show called Ted Lasso, by the way. He said on his show, his fictional character. Um, he says, uh, be curious, not judgmental. Um, so people, you know, if you're an active LDS person and, and you're wanting to, um, to sort of support more 
seek to understand, ask questions, one thing, and then be honest. Um, there's something that people said to me after I come out the church, that, uh, after I left the church, they would say, you know, I love you no matter what. Um, I love, oh, that's okay. Like, it's, a, we, we can still be friends no matter what. Like, come on, like, don't say that. Um, I ha be willing to have honest conversations and, and say, you know, okay, what I believe my doctrine is that, uh, is, is this, you know, how does that make you feel? And, and be willing to engage in those hard conversations where two beliefs clash and be okay and, and, and break down walls to come to a better point of understanding um, instead of just like, you know, there's a lot of cop outs where you just say, you know, I love you no matter what. And then, you know, that, that's, that's really surface level to me. Um, so seek to understand and, and be willing to be honest and, and have hard conversations. I want to say just one thing. I want to disagree with you. Sorry. You said, um, we were forced free agency forced to yeah. see this. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't think that's true. I think we have friends um, and acquaintances whose kids have come out and it's not happening in their world. They don't tell anybody about it. They don't talk about it. When Sally came out, it was really big and once we got you know, ourselves under control, then we talked about it all the time and we told everybody. And the whole time this went on, unbeknownst to us, we have two, fr two very good families that were very good friends with us who have gay kids who never breathe the word. Oh, Nan, your daughter's gay? Really? Oh, wow. How are you? Ha unbeknownst to us, they have a gay child and, ha and never breathe the word of it. So I don't think everybody is forced. I think you have to... Make a choice. Yeah, Kyle, is that what you meant? I said it was Mormon goggles. Right, yeah, yeah, it was through Mormon goggles. But I think you needed to say that. I, I appreciate you saying that. Um, now, what was the question? <laughs> How was our family grown? Um, yeah. Uh, one thing I wanted to say when, when the BYU kids were talking um, is that, and Kyle, that the people that really need to see this probably won't see it. Um, and I hope if any of you guys have a way to get more people to see this, um, please, please let us know. We'll plead with, you know, the producers and see if they can put a little extra money in to maybe, you know, get this out for some people. <laughs> Uh, I, I have gotten countless messages from people who have experienced healing through this. They may already be out of the church, but it's important to be seen and recognize yourself in, in our story. And it's, it's a very healing experience for, for so many people. And they may not be Mormon anymore, but maybe they'll speak up at the table more because of it. I think this is um, something that many nuanced and fringe members of the church have needed to get that like last push out. And I've had hundreds of DMs of saying, now I'm going to get my name removed. I finally made the choice because I watch your show. And I think that's so important to understand is like, yeah, maybe the people who really need to watch it right now aren't watching it, but it's going to be on Hulu. And it will be there as a resource for people for a long time. You know, kind of like podcasts and Mormon stories and Latter-day stories. It's these resources that we have that they're the gift that keep on giving for years and years to come. Totally. Agreed. Yeah. It's not going anywhere. Yeah. I just want to say how proud I am of you guys. Holy shit. <laughs> I have the best family ever. It's amazing. It's, a, I, it's just a, I'm being selfish right now, but it's a really surreal experience and super sentimental for me to have you guys up here with me. I love you. I helped raise these guys, you know. Super special. I, I, I wanted to close it. We're going to do a couple audience questions, but I wanted to close out the panel discussion with something that just stabbed me a little, and that was um, the topic of mixed orientation marriages, and especially the relationships that we each have with our former spouses. 
I was in a mixed orientation marriage. You each were in a mixed orientation marriage. I have, I have a super amicable ex-wife. Um, Lena, you have an amicable ex-husband. Um, but the part of the Mormon No More that hurt me the most was the relationship between you and Shane. Um, in terms of healing, what message could you give to those non-straight spouses in mixed orientation marriages to help better this subject and to help bridge that divide between the new reality and the old family, those families that we once created and had? I think you can speak to the mixed orientation because yeah. her husband left two years before she did. And it was really hard for you. Left the church. Left the church. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, yeah, he was out of the church and I was fighting it and then and then I realized I'm gay. I did not stay in my marriage for very long knowing I was gay. Like, I had a friend, one of my best friend's husbands had been cheating on her, and it was really raw and happening. And I was like, I would never, ever in a million years step out on my husband. Like, it's not a thing. So I knew when I felt the feelings and, and realized and accepted my sexuality that it wasn't, like, I wasn't going to, do anything about it until I had taken care of things with him. And so it wasn't, uh, it, it was not a long time. Um, and I know that's hard, but also um, it was my integrity, you know, and I didn't want to, yeah. Um, what am I speaking here? Oh, oof. This is the sor source the subject for me in the whole with this whole situation. I mean, because uh, it's not it's not it's not done. You know, like I'm still co-parenting with him. It's it's still hard. Um, I haven't talked to him about it yet. And uh, you know, I think if I was speaking to the to the spouses, I would say it's not about you. And that's sad, but it's not. It's not about you. They're not trying to do this to you. And. Um, it's not a choice for me. It's not a choice for your part, for your spouse. And it's, it takes a lot of courage for them to do what they're doing if they're telling you this. And to look at the long term, look at what you want out of your life and see what holding a grudge is going to do for you and your family and what letting it go is going to do for you and your family. Which, which outcome do you want? It's a choice there too. And, uh, I'm sad about it, um, but uh, it could be worse, so, <laughs> and it could be better, so, uh, you know, like, I think um, it's good for people to see both sides. It's good for people to see, like, how how it can be done, and, and then the situation, and, and I can't control it, um, but, like, everybody that's listening who's a spouse, like, does Shane seem happier, or Paul? I mean... Paul was there bawling at our, our wedding, and, like, he's such a big part of our life. I mean, he babysat our kids last night so we could come here, all seven of them. And he, and he, lo and he loves it. He came to Pride with us yesterday. Yeah. It's just, like, it's a joy. It's a real, it's a real special joy to have him in our life. And um, so I think, that, I think that speaks for itself. Anything else to add, Lena? Um, I, I don't know if this answers your question, but for Paul and I, just to set the record straight, we both came from really crappy situations. My mom has been married four times. My dad's been married three times. His dad's been married three times. His mom's been married three times. So if you add all of those up, like that's a lot of divorce in one family. And so from the beginning of our marriage, we'd made that commitment regardless of how many problems we had, we just stayed for that purpose. But once I figured out I was gay, it was like, well, we can rewrite the story and the handbook on what it looks like to be divorced because we know our parents did a really terrible job. You know, we still to this day, I mean, my, well, actually at the wedding, my parents were kind to each other. Yes, this whole experience of me coming out and getting married to a woman, it's like they said hi for the first time in 30-something years. So seeing you and Paul. And seeing Paul and I, yes, yes, that's a huge part of it, too. So They're like, wow, we don't have to be jerks to each other. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. And, too, I think 
Paul and I had gone through a lot of difficulty. Some of you know our story, but we almost lost our twins when they were babies, and that was really, really traumatic. He's fought in two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's like there are worse things that happen to you than getting a divorce. And so our, our children didn't choose this. We don't want them to feel like they're missing out in any way. It's always been an and and not an or for us. It's more abundant, right? There's more room for more people. And we love having him be a part of it. And we would love to have Shane be a part of it, you know? All right, thank you to the panelists. Thank you for your contributions to the story and for continuing to share and, and push this forward to help, uh, to help all of us. We're gonna forego the audience questions for this segment just because we wanna give you a little extra time outside to um, meet with the Osborne family and, and the other cast members. So we'll be back for segment number two after our uh, second episode airs a little later tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting uh, this cast that is amazing. And you've just seen 25% of something that is incredible. And in my opinion, one of the most uh, valuable resources we have at the intersection of LGBT Street and, LGB and LDS Avenue, where <laughs> this Mormonism and sexuality and reality all intersect. Um, We've seen a number of things that I might call the Mormon movement happening in media lately, and I think it's been to our benefit to be able to highlight the marginalized stories of the Latter-day Saint community in or out of Mormonism. Um, for many of us, Mormonism has very, very deep roots, and if we've removed that tree from our landscape, still remnants of that tree exist, and they will forever. And I think highlighting a lot of these stories helps us all become better people and understand the lived experiences of this community. So thank you for being here, and thank you for supporting uh, episodes and stories and families like Mormon No More. <laughs> My name is Kyle Ashworth. I'm the host of the Latter-day Gay Stories podcast. And for those of you who weren't here for our first um, uh, opportunity to screen. I'll just give you another brief background, but uh, the Latter-Gay Stories podcast is not necessarily something that is endorsed by 50 North Temple. <laughs> As you can imagine, I'm not quite certain I'm going to get a Christmas card from the Hollands or the Oaks this year. However, uh, the podcast really was created to help create uh, some resources for LGBTQ people who are navigating uh, in or out of Mormonism, uh, particularly those who were impacted by this topic, who were specifically LGBTQ. Growing up as a closeted Mormon myself in a temple marriage with children, um, I thought a mission marriage and children would fix me, and just doing all the right things would make it all go away. And like your story, it doesn't. And when you, I loved Lena's line where she says, you just can't run from the truth or hide from the truth. And, and when the truth does knock on your door and you answer it, what is it that you do? So that really was the premise behind the Latter-Gay Stories podcast was to cre uh, create better visibility towards this community. So I want to thank you and thank uh, this, this group as well. So uh, we did record the first uh, screening and the comments uh, and the questions that we had as a panel. And then we are recording this one as well. So you can go to uh, the Latter-Gay Stories platforms on Facebook and YouTube and Instagram and all the socials and re-watch uh, the first and this episode as well. And we invite you to share that and share that with the Mormon No More hashtag to help us get a little better visibility. But also just to really get the behind the scenes view of uh, the stories that you didn't see in the documentary and some of the things that might need to be clarified and maybe the soft focus taken off and we get a little more um, clarity on some of those backstories. So uh, you can watch for that. And um, maybe we should start by just uh, letting you get to know a little bit more of this, uh, this panel. And I'll ask each of you uh, what episode you're in and then just tell us a little bit about yourself and what episode you're in and why uh, your story was featured. We'll start with you, Polly. Hey everyone, my name is Polly Choke Mendoza, and um, my story is in the fourth episode. Um, my Mormon story, I guess you could say, is super long, lots of trauma, um, but we focus, probably we all have lots of trauma, um, 
one of the key factors in my episode is about uh, my husband and I, um, and also about our daughter, who uh, we got pregnant when I was not married, and we were asked to pray about giving our daughter up for adoption uh, because I was not married. And I was 27 and not treated with dignity in any way, shape, or form. So we'll probably get into that more, but um, yeah, my story has lots of things into it, and I'm happy to be here with you all. Uh, my name is Bradley Talbot. I didn't mention this in the uh, first panel that we did, but I use he, him pronouns. I'm the founder of Color the Campus. Um, and I got involved because I had people shine pretty flashlights and it got attention. So uh, the lighting of the rainbow and trans Y um, and someone reached out to me and said, hey, we're doing this story. Do you want to be involved? And I said, absolutely. And so that's episode two. Hi everyone, I'm Rin. I'm one of the anonymous BYU students um, in episode two. I use they them pronoums and what are we supposed to say anything else? <laughs> what is it about your story oh, that made it to the um, I actually only get one line in the documentary, but I did do an hour long interview where I cried for most of it. <laughs> so yeah. Um, hi everyone, I'm Maddie. I'm also known as Elder Holland's favorite student. So uh, thanks Chad, shout out to you. Um, I might look a little different. Um, obviously it's because Sally is my muse. But honestly, if I want to be honest, it's your, it's your four-year-old four son, Ozzy. I mean, his hair is amazing. I'm so inspired by him, so, so excited to be here. My name is Kyle Ashworth. You, well, I actually have you in my phone as Matt the Commandeer. Oh. <laughs> Well, let me not. <laughs> I'm also I'm in uh, episode two as well, covering the cover of the campus or color of the cap color the campus. I know it is a lot. Um, uh, highlighting a lot of uh, the literal play by plays as we go through the lighting of the Y, the BYU Police Department, um, the potential arrests, the misdemeanors. The it's pretty intense, so it was really fun to be able to to help with that aspect of it and. Uh, keep up with a little bit of drama, so it was really fun. We watched. It was amazing. Good job, Kyle. I'm Lena Osborne. <laughs> a new bride. <laughs> We're just so, so thankful that you all took the time out of your Sunday evening to come and watch with us, and I was shocked to see how many hands were up. Self-restraint. You guys practiced some serious restraint. We it came out at 9:01 p.m. California time Thursday, and we stayed up obviously <laughs> way too late. But again, thank you so much for taking the time out to be here with us. I'm sure you're tired of my voice by now. <laughs> Never. Thank you. It means a lot. It means really a lot for you guys to be here. I I know that I wouldn't have been able to say yes to doing this documentary if I didn't trust this community. Like, we show up for each other. And it's pretty amazing to feel the love and support that we've felt already. So thank you. Thank you so much. I'm Nan. I'm Sally's mom. Uh, <laughs> I'm in episode one, two, three, four. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, did I say on this first episode that I failed? Did that show up on episode one? No? Oh. At some point in the show, you see me and I say, I was taught my whole life that the whole reason um, that I'm here on earth is to raise a righteous family and to keep them on the straight and narrow path. And I feel like I failed. And I say that in the show. But earlier today, when we did this first round of this panel, and I sat here and watched all my kids, or most of my kids, support each other and uh, just show up in such a big way and be so brave to be so vulnerable, I just thought, this is if this isn't success, I don't know what is.
I'm Rod, and I'm Sally's dad. And, yeah, I have the privilege of being Sally's dad. Um, I'm in, I don't know where I am. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in a lot of them, just little tiny bits. But I'm glad to be here. Thanks. I'm Sam. <clears throat> you haven't seen me yet. I'm uh, in the other episodes. One, two, two, three, four. Uh, I'm Sally's little brother, and I'm a cute boy. <laughs> Ow! Every time before I come to one of these events, I'm always sure I am not gay. <laughs> And I'm Joe. Thanks. <laughs> also a little brother. Oh, I love them. Your hair's not blonde enough to be gay. <laughs> we can change that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sally and Lena. Um, how did you get involved in this project? Um, what was the impetus? What started it? And did it meet your expectations? watching now the four episodes and listening to audience reactions. So <laughs> we had a beautiful photo shoot from this gal that flew down from Oregon to take photos of our family. She has a queer daughter. She's ex-Mormon. She wanted to add to her repertoire and her portfolio this queer couple and all these beautiful kids. And she did it for free, and it was gorgeous and amazing, and we're going to have those photos forever. But little did she know that one of them would go viral on the same-sex parents platform. We were asked to share our story there, and one of our producers, Claire, who's an executive producer for Diane Sawyer, reached out to me and said, I want to start a passion project. Will you do this with me? And we were like, okay, sure, <laughs> let's do it. Uh, the second question was, did it meet my expectations? I think it exceeded my expectations in a lot of ways. I think it's beautifully shot. I am obsessed with all of the stories that were shared, Polly and Brock and Bradley. Maddie Easton, obviously our son, adopted. Um, but their stories were really powerful. And I feel so honored to be able to watch our love story on screen and to have that memorialized. Wait till you get to episode four, the first kiss. It's my favorite part. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, what about you? Yeah. <clears throat> I went into this um, trying to be really, like, Buddhist about it and not have expectations, you know? Uh, because I knew we wouldn't have ultimate power. They had the editing power. So I didn't know how this was going to turn out. And it's blown me away. We've had amazing reception and... Even, uh, it's weird to watch yourself on TV, you know? And um, there are little things like my haircut and stuff that, I know, <laughs> that I'm annoyed with, but... <laughs> and they did take some editing. Um, they, they dramatized things a little bit, uh, like in episode four, when they, they, you'll see that I'm, I apparently had cold feet. And they, they made that a little bigger than they, than it, a lot bigger than it actually was, but... It's TV, and um, I, I know this is bigger than us. This isn't really about us. This is a way, way bigger issue, you know? And I feel honored to be able to tell our story and, and have it be a movement, you know, like this. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm really thankful. It felt, it felt cosmic. You know, I'm not religious anymore, but something, it feels like it was written in the stars, you know? It's, it's just happened, and so I feel super thankful. I really want to try to make, for those of you who will re-watch this, I want to try to make both panels a little different, um, so there's obviously just not repetitive. So I th I'm thinking I want to start with you, Rod, first, um, the Osborne family spokesman of this group. Um, oh. <laughs> The patriarchal yeah. leader, yes. And it actually ties into that. You uh, mentioned in this first episode, early on when Sally came out, 
uh, one of the first places you went was to your ecclesiastical leader, was to your church leader. And that church leader, I don't know, bishop, stake president, um, but that leader gave you some advice. My question is, how true, now that Sally's been out for a number of years, um, how true was that advice? How close was it to reality? And did that advice influence your family for better or for worse concerning this topic? Thank you, Kyle. I think that's a great question. Um, yeah, soon after Sally came out, um, I, it was very difficult for me. Uh, I, just, I just didn't know what to think at the time. Um, I think I got pretty depressed uh, just because I was confused about, about you know, what is now our place, um, uh, what is her place now in the, in the family, what happens when, you know, after we're dead, we're Sally. Um, so I had really soon thereafter a Temple Recommend interview, and I went to... Uh, I went to my bishop. I didn't say anything to my bishop, but I, I went, there was a friend of mine that was in the stake presidency that, that interviewed me, a uh, guy that I, I still respect very much. And uh, I told him, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really in a difficult place right now. My daughter is gay, and I don't know what to think anymore. And uh, he just said... It'll all work out. And uh, I remember sitting there thinking that's not very comforting. Not comforting at all because that's not what we teach. Um, I didn't say that to him. Um, but that set me on a course to start finding stuff out on my own. And uh, I really did from that point on. I really uh, got into history and the development of doctrine, and um, I call it profound disappointment. Um, it was profoundly disappointing to find what I found, uh, you know, in our history and uh, in the development of our doctrine, um, and I mean that in the sense of made up. Um, so, um, anyway, I think... That's all been, I think that's all been great, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's brought us to where we are now, and, and I think it's awesome. I am I'm so happy that uh, I see what I did not see before. It's rare for the boomers to be willing to do that, huh? It's pretty amazing. Nan, I have a similar uh, line of questions um, from the mother's perspective. When often we, we talk about the patriarchal order, uh, now let's talk about the matriarchal order, um, the mother who holds the family together, the glue, and often part of that glue is this, and we mentioned it in the first episode, this celestial bond where the path to exaltation and immortality and eternal life leads through the temple and, and through the celestial kingdom. Sometimes mothers of gay children will mourn the loss of this celestial break where there's a belief that the family can never be strong again because of a big rev revelation like this. Was there a celestial break in your personal experience, your family experience? And if so, how did you heal from that? Sally and Shane left the church a year and a half, two years before Sally realized she was gay. I think leaving the church allowed her to start thinking outside the box, and therefore she started to realize things about herself. So Sally was doomed from the celestial kingdom back then. <laughs> I was already screwed. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I am a future thinker, and um, to my chagrin, and from the minute I had each one of my kids, I I had a plan for them, and I knew what they were going to do in life, and I, I knew how they would look and how I would love them so much. They would just feel it in their bones. Sally was my only daughter. She was going to be a ballerina for sure. I had a little teeny tutu when she was born just because I knew that's what her future was. 
So, <laughs> yeah. Um, Sally, one by one, all my kids showed me that um, that picture that I had practically painted on my mantle in my head was not going to be the real picture. And that was super hard for me, super hard. I just knew if I followed the recipe the church gave me really carefully that I could make that picture come true. And man, when they showed me, when one of the kids would do something that would say, I don't want to be like that in the future, boy, I just buckled down and just said, oh yeah, you know, you are going to have short hair and you are going to wear a white shirt to church and all that kind of stuff. Um, and here I am. My family does not look anything like the picture I thought I had. And it looks so much better. And I, yeah, so much. Um, Lena was not in that picture uh, that I had for my future. And I'm so glad she's in it. Um, I, I feel like when Sally came out, she gave our family a gift to the, the opportunity to stretch and grow in ways we would not have if she hadn't come out. So I am, I am grateful for that. Love you, Mom. All right, we're not going to leave out the last of the Osborne family. So Joe and Sam, you have now had this experience, um, for better or for worse, invade your world. Um, and I'm sure there are some negative criticism that you've received regarding your sister coming out, uh, and maybe even the documentary. Uh, there's also the, the positive aspect of it. You were serving a mission um, when uh, Sally came out. <laughs> So, I'm not going to, I had a fun comment too. Okay. I, I got to keep my comments yeah. reserved. So I, I'm just curious. Uh, so you're serving a mission, your, your sister comes out. What were, what were your expectations or immediate motivations after hearing that? And then um, just both of you briefly give us kind of what the world has looked like um, navigating this forward after the great coming out and the documentary. funny, Sally wasn't girly enough, so my mom raised two boys who wear earrings and paint their nails. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah I, was, uh, I was on my mission in Australia. I had about two months left. Um, and my mom, this was like after they made the change, just barely, where you could like call home every week. Um, my mom messages me and like, hey, Sally wants to talk to you. I was like, that's weird. Like, my mom messages me and says my sister wants to talk to me about something. Uh, I knew it was, was something was up. So um, Sally calls me and she says I'm gay. And I say, oh, shit. You know, like, I, I'm a missionary. Like, I, I got to say that word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ah, the shucks. Um, <laughs> Um, my immediate reaction was, was, uh, sort of like silence to my companions, just like not knowing what to do. Um, the next like night uh, I lived with, uh, another companionship and I, they were like, dude, what's wrong? I was like, my sister told me she was gay. And like all three of them were just like stone faced, like had no idea how to react. And I was just like, yeah. And we like, kind of just like, we didn't really know what to do. And I, at that point I was pretty conditioned to just put my head down and work. Um, I didn't really have a lot of experience with gay people, so I came home and I, I didn't really know what to expect. And I, first time I met Lena, I hopped out of like Sally's van, fresh off the mission, you know, very uh, RM like. Um, and she was like, "Oh my gosh, Joe! Hey, like I've heard so much about you. This is crazy." And I was like, "Ah, oh, was this person that wants to be my sister?" Like, um, but you know, so it's kind of weird. But quickly, um, I saw how normal they were. Um, you know, that's kind of messed up to say, but like it's true. Like I, I, I growing up Mormon and, and super conservative, I, I didn't really. I had this idea of what gay people were like, and any any member of the LGBTQ community, and they they very quickly sort of washed that preconception away. Um, 
and I just saw how how happy they were and how authentic and how real it was. Um, and uh, it took me about you know not too long. I, I quickly started the process of, of um, eventually within about six months, you know, just uh, cutting all ties with the church um, because I, I um, it just it just didn't make sense. Um, and so um, yeah, just just to echo what what my mom said. Um, Sally and Lena gave gave our family a gift. They gave me the gift of, of um, being able to like look inward and, and see an example of, you know, what what we all saw. Oaks, that guy is bullshit, man. Like, come on, like, god damn, everything. Yeah. So, um, it, it's been a it's been uh, just really a gift to experience that, um, and uh, I'm super grateful. <clears throat> My Adderall's wearing off. I'm a little fidgety, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I uh, still go to church uh, every week, and my wife is no longer not in the back uh, in this session watching me, and she won't watch this, Caitlin. Um, <clears throat> so I can talk a little bit, but um, I am... I... When my siblings left the church, it was earth-shattering. I say that later. But it was, yeah, it flipped my world upside down, and I, I was angry. Um, <clears throat> and for a long time, I couldn't even think about my older siblings, uh, my three older siblings that left the church. And um, for a while, I prayed for them. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then after a while, I couldn't even do that. I couldn't even think about them. And, and I was just like, what the heck? You guys are so, you're, you're ruining our celestial family. You know, that's the big thing for me. Um, and eventually I got to a place where, where Sally came out and I, that, that was the biggest blessing for me when Sally came out because it helped me confront my own fear and helped me see that what I felt was threatening me and threatening our family um, wasn't really real and wasn't actually a threat. And our family was whole and our family was good and my siblings were still the same people who raised me and I looked up to and they had not changed. And if anything, changed for the better. And they were living authentically. And I just, I appreciate Sally and I appreciate my, my siblings who, who came before me. And I am, I'm on my way out of the church right now and taking it slow. In, it's tricky. Um, it's it's difficult, as, as we know. But um, I love you guys. Thank you. I'm so glad we have that on. I'm so glad we recorded that. It was so special. I'm continually convinced that I mean, not, the Osbournes are are, are in an incredible family. Um, they're not unique in this space either. Many Latter-day Saint families are experiencing exactly what you're seeing with the Osbournes. And in my opinion, the church is losing some of the best and the brightest because of this topic. And another wonderful family uh, is stepping away in order to step up. And that is where the church is missing out. Lena, just real fast, the Osbournes have been super supportive. We've listened to their stories. We don't hear in your ep in this episode or throughout the remaining ones much of your family and your family support. Maybe give the audience just a little update as to what support system you have on your side of the family, aside from Paul, that we see a lot. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I was a convert to the church. I got baptized at BYU in the Joseph Smith Building when I was 18 years old. And, yeah, there's a baptismal font in the closet of a classroom. And you came out of it? And I came out of it. Yes. Good job. 
<laughs> but my family was devastated when I got baptized. I remember going home for the first time from BYU back, back home and sitting at brunch with my mom on a Sunday, which was something we always did after, after mass. I grew up Catholic. And she just bawled her eyes out and was like, don't ever talk to me about this religion. I don't want to hear anything about it. She says, I think it's a phase for you, and you're going to grow out of it. Smart lady. Um, but <laughs> but it, I was heartbroken because I was convinced that it was the only way. And so I lived 20 years of my life Mormon, and here I am now. Oh, my gosh. My grandmother, so I'm Italian. When I told her I was leaving Mormonism, she's like, I pray for this day for so long. <laughs> it was so cool. So I, I mean, my dad, my mom, everybody is just behind me, my sister, everyone. So I'm highly supported. Yay. I just can't wait to get back on the podcast and let everybody know that as soon as you're baptized a new, a new member at BYU, they force you to come out of the closet. I think that's amazing. All right, let's switch our conversation to BYU. Uh, these three panelists all have stories that are related to BYU. Maybe we'll start with you, Brad. Uh, tell us a little bit about Color the Campus. Um, you clearly have uh, added some rainbow or created a rainbow fortress to one of the most conservative schools on earth at BYU. I'm, I'm wondering what, and we saw um, so much of it in episode two, um, what impact do you think Color the Campus had in the long-term longevity of LGBTQ relationships at BYU? Uh, was it positive, uh, negative? What, what do you think your overall experience uh, running Color the Campus will do for BYU? Okay. Um, my intention with creating Color the Campus Rainbow Day uh, the lighting of the why was because I just felt totally isolated and alone, and I didn't want other people to have to experience that. Um, I had been told my whole life, this is what you do, this is how you do it, and once I started coming out to more people, um, I kind of felt like I was receiving that again, and people were saying, you need to now leave BYU, you need to now leave the church, you need to now uh, do this and that, and I was like, why, why can't I just be me? Um, I think a lot of people benefit from leaving BYU and they need that, but there's also a lot of people that want to be there and they deserve that. Um, they deserve to feel safe wherever they choose to thrive. Um, and with uh, the lighting of the Y and uh, Rainbow Day, a lot of people... Um, would ask me questions of, um, do you feel like this is working? Like, are we are we sending our message? And do you think BYU is going to listen? And I was like, whoa, 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 my message isn't to BYU. My message is to the community. I want the community to know that no matter what, we are here for you. Um, BYU sucks <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, <laughs> but if you want to be there, we will be there and we will sit with you with that. You know, we're not going to force you to leave it. We're not going to force you to stay. Where you want to be is where we're going to go. Um, I think with this whole experience with the docuseries and, and all of that, I really hope people are able to grasp this message that queerness is not this monolith. It's a, I think it's an antithesis to that. Um, Queerness is this huge spectrum, and that's kind of my whole thing with Color of the Campus, is it's not black and white, it's rainbow. Um, there's a place for everybody, and there's not one way to be Mormon, there's not one way to be queer, um, but there's only one way to be you. And um, I can't promise that it's going to be easy. Um, a lot of people, as I was coming out, told me it gets better. That's the thing that we always hear, it gets better. Um, for me, it got worse in a lot of ways for a while. Um, and I was so frustrated that people kept telling me it gets better when it didn't. Um, and so I can't promise that it's going to get better. Leaving the church is hard. Staying in the church is hard. Leaving BYU is hard. Staying at BYU is hard. 
I can't promise that it's going to be easy, but what I can promise is you don't have to do it alone. There's going to be people there that will love you and support you wherever you are at. And just be you, because love always wins. Thank you. And that's a great lead-in to a question that I wanted to bring up and ask you, Rin. Um, in the episode that you're in, you are anonymous. Your face is blurred, and um, you're, there's the, that, the lev that level of anonymity. As a BYU stu student currently, uh, why is that necessary? Why did you feel that you needed to share your story but do it in an, in an anonymous way? Um, who was that to protect? I mean, it was to protect myself because I don't want to get kicked out of BYU. I have, so I have tried to transfer. Like, that's a question a lot of queer BYU students get asked. Like, oh, why do you stay? I'm like, well, for me, it's because I don't have a choice. I didn't have a GE. I needed to transfer to a California State University, which is where I'm from and where I would go. Um, so I was like, if I go on and I tell this story, and what I talked about in my interview was about not only how, like, hard it has been on my mental health, but also an experience where my roommates held an intervention because I was gay, um, which, which is, like, so fun. I, <laughs> uh, it was not fun. It was terrible. I cried. That was one of the first times I ever swore. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> no, it was, it, do you guys want the story? That was <laughs> <laughs> Okay. But no swear words. <laughs> oh, I didn't even say the swear words out loud. I, like, wrote them down. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, earlier that day, I'd had a queer friend over, and we had made cookies. I was not romantically interested in this person, um, but they were very visibly queer, and my roommates knew I was queer. Um, and then we were, like, kind of all sitting in a circle, circle in the kitchen. Really, it was me, like, up on the counter, and them in a half circle around me, which, bad setup, right? <laughs> um, and... They, there was a lull in the conversation, and they all looked at each other. And after my friend had gone home for the day, I noticed that they were all in the back bedroom, but I didn't, like, go and, like, say anything to them. Because like, I was just, like, I was having fun. I was on a sugar high because we had just made snickerdoodles. Like, I was, like, I don't want to go talk to my roommates. They're kind of downers. Um, and they proceeded to be downers by um, coming and saying to me, they're, like, hey, Rin, can we talk to you about something? And I was, like, oh, yeah, sure. What is this? An intervention? And then they were like, no. <laughs> um, and they proceeded to tell me that they wouldn't report me to the honor code office this time. Um, and wh oh, what else did they say? I tried not to think about it because it was not a good time. Um, they also said that one of the reasons why they weren't reporting me to the honor code office this time is because they didn't want anyone to dig on their files and find anything, which is, like, super sketchy. <laughs> um, oh. But, like, they sat there for, like, easily 15 minutes, like, and they just talked to me about how I was not being a good person by being gay, and how I was, they didn't say it in as many words, but how I was just, like, detrimenting BYU by being at BYU, um, simply because I was queer, um, and then, like, I just kind of smiled and nodded along the whole time, and I was like, yeah, of course, I hear what you guys are saying, and that effectively destroyed my relationship with the roommates, and COVID hit a couple months later, a couple weeks later. And also, the honor code change happened literally later that week. Um, so it was just a big mess, but the first time I swore was I like, was writing, in a, I had been writing a to-do list in my notepad, and I flipped the page after they were done with the intervention, and I was like, I effing hate being gay. <laughs> Which is, like, terrible. Like... So anyways, that's the intervention story. But, like, I'm totally off track now. <laughs> it's, it's an important story for people to know because, like, BYU empowers the people who are homophobic. And, you know, I had to, you know, protect myself. I didn't want – I don't – I I really didn't want those roommates to – I don't think they would watch this documentary as much as they need to watch it. Um, I didn't want them to re realize, oh – that's Rin talking. They hate us. And I was like, well, yeah, that hatred's kind of justified. You ruined my life for, like, several weeks or several months. Like, I felt like I couldn't go home to my own apartment. And it was just, it was terrible. Um, but, yeah, I did it to protect myself. And I know 
the other BYU, I, I'm friends with all the inter- anonymous students who got interviewed. Like, we're all in USGA. We talked about it in our group chats. Um, and we were all, like, super scared about doing it. We're, like, nervous when we were offered, like, each of us had a different angle. I'm kind of bummed they didn't use my primary angle, which is a really good side profile. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, we did it to protect ourselves because BYU is actively witch hunting people who are queer like one of my friends is literally under an honor code investigation right now and I'm like you can't kick him out it's his last year so we're it's just so scary to be queer at BYU and I hope that it gets better but I don't know if it will I want to build on that story of protection and kind of highlight your story, uh, Maddie. You were influenced for the better by Harry Fisher and the story of Harry Fisher. How do you think documentaries, specifically Mormon No More, might reach those other Harry Fishers out there who believe that they're unlovable and broken? Yeah, um, that's the whole reason why I think any of us wanted to do this documentary because Unfortunately, we know what it feels like to not have any visibility or representation, to not know that we could have a future in the church being gay, out of the church being gay, that that there were any other options for us besides just such self-hatred and shame. And and so, yeah, I, I hope that all the Harry Fishers out there, whether they're male, female, gay, trans, anyone who feels like they don't fit in or are marginalized, that that you're not alone. You know, that I hope this documentary shows that you can be in, in your 30s and come out with your kids and have a blended family and that your family, no matter their beliefs, that it is possible to have that community and to have that togetherness. And um, I wish that my friend Harry had felt that. I wish I had felt that earlier. I'm glad that I do now. And um, all of us here, we're going to work until every single queer kid feels that way, feels safe and protected and loved just as they are. And that protection, especially with kids, leads me into your story, Polly. You, um, you have a, f- a fascinating angle to this in uh, episode four. That's right. Um, my question is, how, Im- how, as you've embraced not only your sexuality and heritage, how has that made you a better person and advocate for those who are put in your situation? And you alluded um, earlier in this panel uh, interview that you uh, were pregnant and the church through LDS Family Services advised you to give up your child for adoption as the best option for you. You also were, were dating a man who was not a member of the church at the time. Speak to that situation and how could your story and, and, and what was your belief that coming through uh, Mormon No More might help other people? What was it that you wanted other people to see through Polly's story? Thank you. I'm going to try to remember all those questions. <laughs> um, I think one of the most important things for me was, like Matt said, that you're not alone. Um, through so much of my life, I felt alone. And um, my queer story didn't really get told in the documentary, but um, I think like a lot of queer people, we're closeted. And you know, my family had the proclamation to the family on the wall. I never felt safe to come out, even though I have really wonderful parents and they're very loving, um, but I knew I was not safe for a lot of reasons. And um, I knew also growing up in Utah, being a minority, um, being a person of color, I and, and going to a ward that was no one looked like me. Um, I wanted to do this documentary because I knew that there's a lot of other people like me. Um, even in this room, you know, I, I'm, a minor, I'm a minority even among ex-Mormons. And I want other people of color who see this to see a minority and to see it's not all... Um, it's not black and white thinking, and there's a lot of cultural things and traditional things, and there's a lot of beauty outside of Mormonism that I have got to reclaim. Um, sorry, I'm trying to remember all the questions. Um, 
so in in regards to dating my spouse, um, when we met, I well actually let me fast or rewind a little bit as far as my queerness and my queer story. I am I identify as bisexual, pansexual. Um, my first kiss was actually a girl, and I um, really liked girls. I really I'm attracted to everybody. I mean. Um, I care about the soul of the person. That's always been something that I've noticed about myself. Um, body parts are parts, but the soul is the soul, um, is how I see it. And so, um, but I was closeted. I never allowed myself to really date someone. So when I moved away for college, I would drink occasionally, and that was my getaway. That would be my time where I'd let myself flirt with a girl or you know, hold hands with a girl, but I would never go past that. I would never really allow myself to go past that. So um, when I met my spouse, he kind of called it out before I could even fully say those words, I'm bisexual. He kind of saw it in me. And um, give it up for Adan, by the way. He does not, he, yeah, they wanted to interview him for this, and he's like, no, babe, that's all you. He does not want to be in the spotlight, so I'm sorry, babe. But um, he has been the most supportive person in my life, the most wonderful human. Um, and when we met, he was not Mormon, and I fell, I fell in love with him, and that was, oh, man, a huge struggle. I think people in the gay community, and I think also straight people can recognize that you cannot date someone who's not Mormon. Like, that is not okay. And uh, that was not okay with my parents in any way. And um, I was 22 when I met him. So it was very rocky. We went through a lot, to say the least, because um, I, I was still a true believer in the church. So I, in a lot of ways, wanted to do this documentary also for justice for him in a lot of ways because I projected onto him what my family was projecting onto me, which is what the church projected, which was um, he wasn't good enough for me. He wasn't this checklist of return missionary or even Mormon at the time or any of these things. And I saw him for him, but I also knew everybody wanted him to be this checklist. And um, we fought for each other. We really fought. I had bishops try to tear us apart, and literally, like, uh, I had a bishop send us to therapy because we were having sex and couldn't stop having sex. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not making that up. I'm not, I'm not making it up. The bishop thought we had a problem because who doesn't like sex, right? I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> but the bishop thought it was a problem. Anyways, that's a whole other thing, but, um, yeah, it was just very rough because I believed in the church, but obviously I wasn't fully living it. So I had um, a lot of back and forth in my soul. I had a lot of back and forth of feeling like I wasn't good enough and getting that messaging anytime I'd really go to church. Um, there were a lot of hard things we went through, and I finally said, you know, I, I want to be with you. I don't want this church to break us up. And we started talking about getting married uh, not in the temple, we were thinking about that, but he really, he had already joined the church, but he really had a hard time with things um, in the church. So that's when we found out I was pregnant, and our world changed for the better. Um, our daughter is seriously the most amazing light in this world. Um, also, kind of a backstory, I have an autoimmune disease, so I didn't even know if I could have kids or not. So getting pregnant was this huge, amazing gift for me. And um, I was 27, and I was not treated with dignity. I was treated like a 14-year-old who, you know, got pregnant at a one-night stand or something. It was really, really, really tough. Um, as you hear me say in the documentary, the church is all about families, but it really did try to tear apart my family in multiple ways. But trying to steal my daughter from me was the absolute worst. Um, and I have come to find out that this, my story with my daughter is not uncommon. I've actually talked now to multiple people who the church gave them that same advice they gave me. Not advice, but um, 
the same kind of talking to, like you need to put your child up for adoption. And uh, some of these people that I've met did, and they are now trying to reconnect and find their child that they gave up. So my story, getting it out in this documentary was important because I know I'm not the only one. And I know that there are other parents out there who the church counseled horribly to, and now they're trying to find their child. So I think this is an important outlook to have because uh, before I, when I went through it, I didn't know anybody. And I didn't know that this is what the church did. I thought it was just, I, I still have a lot of respect for that bishop in a lot of other ways, but I thought he was, and I knew he was wrong. So uh, fight for your family. Do not let things tear them apart. <laughs> Fight for your family. Um, and seeing all of you, the Osborne family, like I actually have a question for them, if that's okay. Um, what advice would you all give to a family who isn't accepting? And, um, you know, to parents who are still very enriched in the church to siblings who don't even talk to me anymore, um, what advice would you give, I guess, for me, and if they ever watch this, maybe for them too? So when, when somebody comes out, everyone needs to hold space for everyone. It's not just one way. It's not just, uh, I've got to hold space for Sally as she figures out how to be gay, but she held space for me and for the rest of us as we fumbled our way through how to be the family of a gay daughter. And um, I have learned not to take offense from Sally because I said a lot of things wrong um, with good intentions, but, but the incorrect thing to say. And she held space for me and didn't get offended she knew the intentions of my heart, and so she, I've learned through this process what I did wrong and how I could do it better, but she was so patient with me. So I, and that really helped me, because if she hadn't been, because she was so patient with me, I felt comfortable to be open with her and to ask her questions, to have conversations with her, where if she had been offended because I said the wrong thing once, I would have shut down and said, oh, I better not talk about this anymore. So our relationship was able to, I don't want to use the word heal, but rearrange itself into a better version now because of that. So the one piece of advice I would say is whoever you're dealing with, whether it's your bishop or your parents or your gay loved one or whatever, don't take offense. Um, it won't, it won't get you anywhere. And, um, I feel like, kind of like when you have a two-year-old and they have a tantrum, or a ten-year-old that says, I hate you, mom. There's no point in taking offense that your kid hates you. We all know you just say, well, I love you, and you can't do anything about that, and I will always love you, so, you know, Think what you want to think. That's how I feel about when you have a family um, issue, like Polly, where she has siblings that won't speak to her. My advice would be, you know, send them a Christmas card anyway. Send them an email anyway. Love them anyway. And don't let that stop you from loving them how they act to you. Just keep going forward. It, they'll eventually figure it out. Just one thing short. Uh, what's allowed me to do that is my own healing, my own personal healing. I have done a lot, uh, and we have done a lot of deep, uh, uncomfortable work on ourselves. And understanding and deconstructing Mormonism and our childhood and everything helps me to see them better. I mean, you guys have all been Mormon, so you understand where they're coming from. And I think just realizing that nothing is about you. Literally nothing that anyone else does is about you, and that goes for everybody. So it's important to realize that and to, to witness everyone and witness their conditioning and their own childhood wounds and realize that we're all just 
fumbling around trying to figure it out. And being able to have boundaries and also hold space and be loving is, a, is an interesting balance, but it's possible. I mean, I just kept coming back to the bond that we have and the love that's really there. And that's what kept me continuing to, to grow and to not um, get stuck in my pain. All right, as we wrap the last of this screening, and a, a, just a wonderful day. I've, I've been so impressed with the stories, with the vulnerability, with the discussion um, that we've had today. I want to leave the last word to Lena and Sal. Um, what haven't we discussed that you wanted to share with this audience, with not only the audience that have been here to support you, but the Mormon No More audience? Is there a singular message, or even perhaps if we were sitting here in a room full of general authorities. What, what message would you have in closing um, to either of those groups? Uh, <clears throat> I think this comes down to humanity and respecting and loving people as they are. It's, it's about patriarchy. It's about racism and, and sexism and bigotry. It's like, when I realized I was gay, it was the craziest thing. I was like, how is this a thing? Why is this, why did anyone ever say this was bad? This is the most beautiful feeling I've ever experienced. And it really comes down to shining a light on that. We're all the same. Everyone being themselves is if you don't if you're not treating someone like that's beautiful then it's then you got to think again goodness i am just in awe i'm in awe of this whole experience and what it has done for us and our family i mean we have sobbed the f when Joe told us he was leaving the church, we saw, I mean, it was just like a ripple effect, you know? And, and to know that we didn't do anything, we just decided to be ourselves. Yeah. And that that same exact thing, even if you're not gay, applies to everyone. When you live authentically, it's contagious. And I hope that that's the message people take away, is that you don't have to be gay or come from the Mormon church to have profound changes in people's lives. You can just be you, and it will send a message that it's okay for other people to be them. Thank you. I want to thank the audience as well for participating and for supporting this cast, for supporting the OUT Foundation and the many LGBT. Uh, LGBTQ organizations that benefit through your allyship and your love. And again, another round of applause to the cast for their vulnerability and their great messages of love. Thank you. No, I'm good. He says group photo, so. Oh, yeah, we're going to get a group photo. Oh, yes. I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to stand before you and. Well, here, can I wrap up? Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, we'll have Sally and Lena go out if you want to get some, a photo on the way out. Uh, thanks again for Broovies for hosting us. Johnny Hebda, thank you so much. Claudia, Blair. Um, now go home, download Hulu if you don't have it, and watch the other three episodes. Yeah. All right, thank you, everybody. Have a great night.